The ocean is on the rise. Temperatures are on the rise. Large super storms are on the rise. Population is on the rise. Everything is on the rise. How do we respond to that? We rise too. I'm going to flash back real quick to the 1980s. I grew up between a cornfield and a cow pasture. My closest friend was eight fields away. I was playing in the woods. I was swimming in the rivers. I had a little bit of an Indiana Jones complex. And because of that, I sought out more adventure. I joined the Boy Scouts. I learned how to go caving. I learned how to ski, how to hike. I learned how to build forts out of trees and needles. I went a step further, and as I was getting my Eagle Scout, I went and worked at Boy Scout camp. I loved being outside so much, I found myself in the Conservation and Ecology Lodge. And I wanted to share this love of the outdoors. So I taught other scouts about ecosystems, about rivers. And I loved this so much. In 2000, I went to university for environmental science. But I wasn't your typical student. I sought out research projects. So as a freshman, I went down to Mexico and worked in a sulfur cave studying fish. Random. <laughs> I went to Australia to study abroad because I wanted to understand more about the whole world that we live in. I studied corals on the Great Barrier Reef. I did a project with the National Science Foundation in the upland Adirondack watershed, upstate New York. One time while I went on a hike, I, I hiked probably 50 or 60 mountains in the Adirondacks, I came across a bunch of dead trees on top of this mountain. It was really out of place. And I went and I did some research, and I found that these trees had lost the waxy coating on their needles. Losing the waxy coating on their needles is like removing your winter coat, and the trees froze to death in the winter. This happened because of acid rain. Acid rain is a human-caused situation in our environment, and we reversed that. We don't see acid rain like we used to. We also worked and had an impact on the hole in the ozone layer. You don't hear about that anymore because the ozone layer is repairing itself. So now we have this opportunity with climate change to affect change on our world on an even larger level than we have before. And I knew in my last 18 years of research that I kept seeing, as an environmental scientist, that we just keep impacting the environment. And I had a choice to make. Do I want to stay here and continue to document this impact, or do I want to affect change on the system? Do I want to rise to the occasion? And when I say rise in this case, I think of it as an acronym. To be resilient, to be innovative, to be sustainable, and to be efficient. And we can rise by utilizing technology. We live in an age of accelerations. Technology is accelerating. Climate is accelerating. Applying that technology and partnerships, engaging one another, having conversations, and putting that all together with policy. Policy is a foundation that will allow us to springboard New York City is a great example of how they responded with policy. They responded in 2012 to Hurricane Sandy with one New York City, a resiliency plan that involves growth, equity, engaging the population, resilience and sustainability. And they did this by engaging civic leaders, businesses, government officials, the community itself, the New Yorkers. Then we saw in 2015 the world come together in the Paris Accord and saying we recognize that climate is happening and we want to see renewable energy technology and springboard from that. 
New York City, with their one New York City plan, now has their circuit breakers 35 feet above sea level. Fiber optic lines are covered so that they can't be flooded. They shored up their buildings so that they're stronger, they're more resilient. And they are enhancing their natural buffers, their wetlands. If you were in the Caribbean, you would be building mangroves. So you have that first natural line of defense. And I think one of the best policies as we move forward is net zero energy buildings. We see states, we see governments moving in this direction. Historically, net zero energy buildings have cost more, maybe 10% more. Five years ago, I did a case study on a net zero home in Washington, DC. It sold for 16% over market value. It probably cost the builder about 10% more to make, but as a builder, investing in the future and investing in your own profits and the economy, this really makes sense. Literally dollars and cents, increasing profit. We also see this on the public side. We designed a net zero energy high school. It would cost an extra 10 to 12% up front, that would be paid for in the first 10 years of operation. And if you look at a 50-year building life, it would save an additional $40 million in energy. $40 million in energy costs that we otherwise would have spent. So if we're rebuilding our homes and our schools and our government buildings and our businesses, it would make economic sense to build net zero energy buildings. But there's always resistance. There's always pushback. It costs more. We can't handle that cost. So in 2016, I said, I had enough of this. I understand the built environment and the natural environment. I need to bridge the gap. I've used my science background to quantify sustainability. And I said, I'm going to apply this and build net zero energy buildings at the same price point as conventional construction. So in 2016, I started that design process. In 2017, we started building buildings. And we did just that. We built it at the same price point. Now, people are going to ask, how do you do this? How do you do this? Because we've been using and we've been making building codes, building buildings, making our planning documents, all built for the world of yesterday, not for the world of tomorrow. And we know what tomorrow looks like. We can call it by its name, Harvey, Irma, Maria. This is what tomorrow looks like. Why don't we build for tomorrow instead of yesterday? So one of the ways we can do this in our buildings, right? We're in a box right now. We have a ceiling, a floor, four walls. We insulate all six sides of that box. We bring in daylight. We reduce the number of light fixtures. Typically, I see buildings overlit by 30 to 40 percent. Reduce 30 to 40 percent of those fixtures. You're cutting costs. You're optimizing your lighting in the environment. We shade the side of the building that gets the most sun. This also reduces the size of the cooling system. We position our building so that we can benefit from natural breezes and reduce heat loading from the sun. When we do this, we shrink the size of the cooling system. So the money that went into this mechanical system got pushed over to a better built building. So it doesn't cost more money, we're just transferring costs around. The next thing that we do is we throw solar on the roof. We've made our building so efficient that the space we have on the roof can produce enough of energy for our own energy needs. And if we have an unreliable grid, we can throw batteries on top of that and, keep an, and have an energy independent building. And I said when I was doing this, energy isn't enough. What other issues do we have in our society? Water. Now we have the technology to pull the humidity out of the atmosphere and turn it into potable, drinkable water. We filter it, we put it in storage, keep it clean with UV light. And this is scalable. You can make 10 liters a day, 30, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000 liters of water a day from the humidity in the atmosphere. We're starting to solve problems. And if we compost and recycle all of our waste, we don't have the waste. We won't have the plastics in the ocean. We have to put pressure on 
our supply chain to give us only materials that we can reuse, recycle, or compost. Why do we need to have waste? We didn't have waste over 150 years ago, right? We call those archaeological sites. They're shells, they're pots, they're clay. They go back to the earth. Let's get back to where we were with that, looking forward. I built homes, office spaces, even fun stuff like dog kennels, brew pubs. We can even build medical centers, potable, movable medical units. And what's really fun, we can actually put inside of a shipping container, you can retrofit them in 320 square feet to grow almost three acres worth of crops. So if we now think about this, we've just positioned ourselves to be able to generate our own food, our own energy, our own water, and have shelter that's resilient to storm events. It's not going to blow down because we've thought through that structure. It's not going to fall and hurt us during earthquakes because we've thought through all of these design components, and it doesn't have to cost more. And I called this Rise Industries. Why? Because we're being resilient, innovative, sustainable, efficient, and I called it industries because it's a collaboration. It's not one company. I can't do this alone. I'll oftentimes go into a meeting and I'll say, help me help you help me help us. Because I can't do this alone. I can't just rise by myself. Because when the tide is coming in, we all rise. We see other companies, even here in the Caribbean, being rising as well. In Puerto Rico, 35% of the economy comes from the pharmaceutical industry. One of those companies is called AstraZeneca, and I've worked with them in the past and still working with them. They had a resiliency plan. Ironically, maybe they, they predicted the storm, but they practiced a Category 4 hurricane before Maria hit Puerto Rico. And they had built relationships with the government officials, the utility, the community members. And so when Maria hit, they hit the ground running. They brought in food, water, ice, emergency generators for not only their employees, but the community. They put their employees to work for the utility company to get emergency generators back up and running. Because they had built these relationships and partnerships and planned and practiced that plan the same way we practice fire drills in school, so we know what to do when something happens. They were back up and running in three weeks. And what's important about them having operations and them being able to operate is they provide some of the top medicines for the entire globe. So if we're down, everybody's down. If we rise, everybody rises. Here in the Virgin Islands, we've seen roofs torn off, we've seen windows knocked out, we've seen people impacted, and there's technology today, ferrous cement technology. Has anybody heard of this? It's basically a metal mesh, similar to chicken wire, but a little bit stronger. And you use cement, you add some additives in it, so it becomes structurally sound. You have this structural exterior wall. Now, we can put that metal mesh and cement and you apply the cement the same way you would plaster on top of your roofs. So we have roofs that the metal pins down into the existing concrete structures. We don't have to knock down our buildings, our infrastructure. We just enhance it. We support it. We make it stronger. It won't blow away in the next storm event. It won't fall on your head during the next earthquake. Jamaica is already using this technology. This is one way that we can build stronger buildings. You could build a new house out of ferro cement in seven to 10 days. So if we need to supply housing, we can hit the ground running, coming together as a community, building the homes that we need that we know are going to be resilient, that aren't going to blow down in the next storm. There's also opportunities with waste and capturing heat energy so that we can start connecting and gridding, micro-gridding our communities together. We can make small parts of the island islands of unto themselves, so we don't have this infrastructure that's going to get blown down. When we do this, we can rise. We can be resilient. 
How do you see yourselves being resilient? How do you see innovation applying in your life? Sustainability, efficiency, because now is the time to rise. Thank you.